Alrighty, so the first two game of the CONCACAF Champions League this season is in the books, and there was no doubt that both of these games had some exciting action that happened, including one of them really went full CONCACAF throughout what happened in the full 90 minutes. And we'll get to that game when we, we get to this review. But first, let's talk about the first game of this CONCACAF Champions League campaign, and that was between Marathon and and the Portland Timbers. Now, the good news for the Timbers is that they did not lose this game, and that they were able to take two away go heading into that second leg game against Marathon at Providence Park, but the bad news is they also didn't win this game. Uh, they gave up two goals in this game, and you know, last season, besides the fact that the Timbers' biggest issue was they always tend to collapse every single game and basically gave up late goals pretty much on a regular basis, one of their other biggest issue was their defense and some some bad defensive habit that they they fall themselves into in some of the games that they play last season well unfortunately in this game those bad defensive habit basically ca came back in this game and probably was the reason why they weren't able to get a win in this game against marathon now when i look at the star 11 for the timbers in this game uh it was a relatively strong team uh, there were a couple of notable absences with Abobasi and Blanco not available in the Star 11 in this game. Uh, Abobasi was not available because apparently he had a hamstring injury coming into this one. And Blanco, obviously, we know he is still recovering from that torn ACL. And despite the fact that there was rumors saying that most likely Everisi was going to put him back in the, the Star 11 in this one. I mean, when you look at how, how this game, and especially... The first thing I wrote here, here besides talk about the Star 11 for the Timbers, is that the pitch at this stadium looked absolutely hideous. I mean, it was a very heavy and rough pitch. And in some way, kind of summarize what a lot of Central American team have to de deal with, or a lot of MLS team have to deal with when they go to, to Central America to play against a Central American opponent, where they're going to have to play a pitch like the one that the Tim Timbers have to play in which was a pitch that was very heavy and rough and that every time when you try to pass the ball the ball doesn't actually roll on the pitch and that when you try to play a direct ball the the ball basically bounces in a way where it just kind of come to a complete dead dead stop and doesn't bounce the way that you would like like to do and in other words it's basically a, a very challenging kind of pitch condition that a lot of these MLS team and the Portland Timbers had to face in this game and also because all of that you knew that Sarisa was taking no risk knowing the the fact that you know Blanco coming off of that torn ACL if he would have played in this game I would fear that his, his legs probably would 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 be be reactivated and he could could maybe suffer another serious knee injury with the way how this pitch was actually actually was now in this game also uh there was two Timbers debut with both Claudio Bravo and Jose Van Reken making their Timbers debut. Uh, both of them, they had an okay game. I mean, Van Reken did get on the, the assist chart in this game. But both of these guys were not good at all. When when they had some defensive defensive responsibility. And especially Bravo where I think he, he was a big culprit of one of the goals that that the, the Timbers can see in this game. Now, in the first half, besides me talking about the pitch look heavy and rough, three minutes into this game, Jimmy Chara actually had a big opportunity for the Timbers to get the early lead, but it was denied by Torres. Before Valeri actually hit the post after he was trying to toe poke past the goalkeeper from a tight angle, and this was just a play that I have no idea how Valeri was ab able to get this one, off, get the ball onto the post, because I think he was trying to toe poke this one over the keeper head from a tight angle and try to maybe sneak it into the back of the net and yet somehow in some way way that one still ends up hit, hitting the post and that Valeri came inches close for, to get the Timbers a one nothing lead but the Timbers at least they look very sharp early in this game which is something that you usually do not see a lot of MLS team do in the first game of the CONCACAF Champions League because usually when MLS team play their first game of the CONCACAF Champions League it's basically their first game of, of the season but the Timbers at least in the first 15 minutes show that they look like they already are, are in mid-season form and that they could maybe get a couple of goals in this game with how sharp they had early on and they probably could have got a goal in the 25th minute when Darren Aspirit should have scored after going 
through on goal, although I wouldn't say they probably should have got a goal during that moment because you know Darren Espira, he's not allowed to score a goal unless it's November or in the MLS playoffs. But then just one minute later, they probably should have should have got got the opening goal here if it wasn't for Torres that absolutely robbed Eric Williamson on the volley. And this was just a great individual kind of effort from Williamson to basically flick it over one of the marathon defender and basically hits that one on the volley. If that one went in, that would have been an absolute highlight reel. But unfortunately, Torres with an incredible save to deny the Timbers the opening goal. But ultimately, you knew eventually the Timbers were going to get that opening goal. And they did. In 35th minute, Felipe Mora finally give the Timbers a well-deserved 1-0 lead from Vine Rakin to get to to give Portland a 1-0 lead. And you're, you're thinking, well, now the Timbers finally got that breakthrough. They should maybe score two or three three goals after that and pretty much open the floodgates on this marathon defense. Well, unfortunately, that was not how, how they drew, drew up because just three minutes later, they would con concede and it would be Castillo, the one that scores the equalizer for marathon from Solano. And only the fact that this was against the run of play, but the way that Castillo basically casually tapped that one into the back and it just tells me something must have gone wrong to this this Timbers back line. Like, you don't usually see a... a guy able to just just casually easily tap this one into the back of it like that unless if if the opposition defense clearly have some mix up and in this play there was clearly some miscommunication that ha ha happened in th in this instance that allowed Cast Castillo to do exactly that but we're heading into halftime with a 1-1 one, one, one scoreline which I don't I don't think that's going to play Savarisi with the way that how they dominate the, the pretty much the entire first half but heading into the second half uh marathon almost got the go ahead go and almost took the lead for the very first time after clark was able to rob to share on a free header i think this was from a a free kick then the timbers did retake the lead and this was a very unfortunate play from from marathon goalkeeper torres and and marathon th themselves because First of all, this was a great free kick from Valeri where he, where he was able to strike this one from about 34 yards out. Torres originally made a great fingertip save to tip this one onto the post. But when the ball bounced off the post, it basically bounced right toward his back and pretty much bounced right back into the, the path toward go and actually end up into the back of the net. Like that was almost like a FIFA kind of glitch that happened in real life. And, you know, it's a very unfortunate situation there but that being said that was still a beautiful full kind of free kick that Valeri has and that I feel like with how he hit that free free kick kick in that instant he definitely deserved, deserved a goal and even though he didn't really deserve the goal because his free kick technically didn't go go on target and this this goal only happened because it it, it was an unfortunate instant where Torres Torres uh, basically or the the ball basically bounced off the post and then bounced off of Torres, Torres back and then redirect toward goal. It still was definitely one that Larry, I think, maybe could could have. Well, I wouldn't say maybe, but the Timbers definitely did deserve it. Now, just just nine minutes later, after that kind of free goal that the Timbers had, Marathon was able to get the equalizer. Now, unlike in the first half where I was kind of surprised that Marathon got the equalizer, this one I wasn't surprised because I thought Marathon was playing much better. In, in the second half. In the second half, I thought it was a relatively e even game between both of these teams with chances for both of these team team in the second half. And Marathon was able to get the equalizer in the 67 minute when Ramirez was able to score for Mariga to tie the game up at two apiece. I believe Ramirez was actually really, really falling to the ground and actually lost his footing and somehow, in some way, he was still able to put enough power to get past. Steve Clark, but at the same time, that was not good defending from the Timbers, the fact that they did not close him down whatsoever. But yeah, Marathon ties the game up at that point. As I mentioned, it was an even second second half, and it seems like the game was really up for grabs. Marathon almost got that third goal when Steve Clark once again denied Teixeira on a header, this time from a corner, before the Timbers pressed for a winner in the last five minutes, but they weren't able to do so as the final score of this game 
ends up to be a 2-2 draw between both of these teams. Shots in this game, 16 shots compared to the 12 that Mariton has. 5 shots on goal compared to the 4 that Mariton has. 5 shots off target compared to the 6 that Timbers had. 3 shots that was blocked compared to the 5 that Portland has. And possession-wise, 42% possession compared to the 58% possession that the Portland Timbers had in this game. And again, the good news for the Timbers is that at least heading home for this second leg, they at least have a, a good 2 to away goal, goal uh, advantage, and that they don't necessarily need to win that that second leg unless it, if the the score line ends up to be like like more than just two two or maybe end up to be be free free. But the bad news for the Timbers is that they got to make sure they do not lose that that second leg, and that they got to fix their their defense defense heading into the second leg because this defensive performance that the Tim Timbers had in this game was just not good enough whatsoever. Now, moving on into the next game is the game that I mentioned earlier that pretty much went full CONCACAF. And, you know, if you wonder what exactly is a CONCACAF Champions League game that basically went peak CONCACAF, well, basically, it's a game where there's a lot of theatric that happen, and there might be, like, a red card that happen, and also some free play that happened in the game. And most importantly, the, the important ingredient of a game that really went peak CONCACAF is that if there is going to be a very controversial call that affect the outcome of this game. Well, that is exactly what all those things happen in this one. And for once, a MLS team was able to get the benefit of the doubt with, with a con controversial play that actually ends up in their favor. And in this case, Atlanta, of course, exactly got got that and we'll explain later what exactly was the controversial play that ultimately led to the only goal for Atlanta in this game and them winning this first leg against Alahulunse. But first, uh, a lot of Atlanta fans were thinking whether or not if Joseph Martinez was going to be starting on, on, on or starting in the starting in 11 in this game or even play in this game because, you know, there was a lot, lot of hype around that after he after a, almost, almost, uh, well, not almost, but a full year of recovery from his torn ACL that he suffered last season, we would probably maybe see Joseph Martinez back in in this team. And while he wasn't in the star eleven in this game, he did start it on the bench and did came off the bench in the second half. But in the first half, I want to just quickly say that compared to the earlier game, the big pitch at Ali Say Stadium looked absolute world class, and you know. It was so refreshing to kind of see see a stadium and especially the grounds crew did a good job in terms of maintaining their pitch because the difference between how how this game actually went and how the flow of this game went with the ball kind of finally zipping through through the pitch normally compared to this one where the ball wasn't really zipping through and was just just feels like like they were playing playing in mud with the ball just kind of getting stuck on onto the pitch yeah it, it was so much more refreshing seeing seeing what ha happened here here compared to what we saw in this game and you know in the first 10 minutes i thought ollie holland say looked like they were the better side as atlanta looked a little bit disjointed in the first 10 minutes and this was kind of expected knowing the fact that atlanta with them having pretty much much a a complete new squad and also a a new head coach and gabriel hansley it was going to take time for this team to get get things going which they eventually did in the 10th minute after Maria was able to push away Barco free kick from a long range. Ezekiel Barco was a man on on a mission tonight. Like this was probably the best performance I've seen Barco play in a very long time. And if this is kind of the performance that Barco can can perform throughout the rest of the season, no doubt this could be a chance where maybe Barco can finally fulfill his potential to be a very decent player for this team. Now, three minutes later, Moreo was able to deny Lissandro Lopez a chance for Atlanta to get the opening goal. Now, while the attack for Atlanta was started to fighting their feet, their defense was not so. And, and you know, in the first half, I thought the Atlanta back line was really playing with, with fire against this Ali Hansley attack where there was multiple times where they're trying some ri risky kind of pass and also kind of playing a high line against a team that was putting a lot of direct passes and a lot of over-the-top passes and I'm guessing maybe the reason why they decided to play a high high line against a team that that is more more direct on the attack is trying to maybe may maybe play the offside trap and trying to cut them going going offside when the ball is playing 
over the top but the problem with that strategy or i should say it isn't really a problem more like the risk of that strategy is that if you don't get the the off side trap right yeah that 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 play player that you basically decide to let let go off by playing a high line he's basically now going through and go and have a chance to go on a one-on-one -on -one opportunity and i also thought that there was some questionable goalkeeping decision that brad guzan had in this game i mean there was just times where he basically come off his lines lines in 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 a way where i i don't necessarily think he needs to come off his lines and then there was also even times when he did come off his line he basically wandered in a position where that was like no man's land a goalkeeper should be and he was just completely way out of his position position but but ultimately Atlanta did did even with them playing with fire they still were able to to do a good job in ter terms of catching this Alejandro attack offside a lot like this Alejandro attack was offside a lot in the first half and throughout this entire part of the game now in the 34th minute Barco did thunder a 30 yard shot that just wide I mean again Barco he's a Man on a mission in this one, and he doesn't care if he, he he's shooting one from 30 yards out. out. And that one, you know, not only there was a lot of pace in that shot, but it just went wide off the right side side of the post. Uh, Lennon, I thought, was getting a lot off the ball, but they couldn't really quite find the final ball, which was really pretty much just sums up the, the frustration with Atlanta last season where their attack just, you know, when even when they do have a lot of the ball, they just don't have have anybody that can find that crucial final ball to get give their attacker chances to get into good space to basically score a goal now in the 41st minute guzan who remember how i mentioned how he made some questionable goalkeeping decision and there was just multiple time where he basically wandered in a no man's land and completely caught out of position well he those kind of deci questionable decision eventually kind of caught up to him and you know the old saying if you know you can only play with fire un until it actually burns you well in this instant it burned guzan uh he basically came off his lines to try trying to to basically make a tackle on captain only who was going through on goal but unfortunately he did not get the ball when he made that challenge on Capanoni and because of that it's dog so now what's interesting is is that the referee originally show a red card to to or show a yellow card to Guzan which you know I thought that was maybe going to be like one of those conky calf moment where the referee once again make a bad bad decision because it was clear that that was a red card and a lot of the Alejandro player was actually surround the goalkeeper and was very angry the fact that it was only a yellow card but ultimately the referee did make the right decision and he changed his mind to give guzan a red card which means that Atlanta would have to bring in their second goalkeeper which was their young kid roco rios novo who turns out after this game i think a lot of people would know, would know his name because he kind of had a thomas hassell s kind kind of performance when he came on for Guzan who of course was sent off and Moreno was sacrificed in this game because of that now heading into the second half after you know you know at halftime Atlanta was able to head to have with a nil nil draw but you kind of feel like heading into the second half they were just hoping to hang on throughout the entire second half so they can preserve a nil nil draw heading into the return leg but instead they got one they got something even better because in the 50 minute Barco would score on the penalty spot to give Elena a 1-0 lead. And this is where the controversial moment happened. And this is where also where the peak CONCACAF mo moment happened. Where apparently it looked like it was a handball on Seventh Turi. But when, I, when you look on the, the replay play of this, it's pretty clear that when that cross was, was coming in. I think it was George Bellow that crossed this one in but when the ball was crossed it in it looked like it actually hit Savitari face instead of actually actually his his hand and you know the referee I think he clearly he didn't see that that relatively well and also I think there's no doubt that if there was VAR in this this probably would not not have been a penalty but because there was no VAR in this and we're still in the world where where concave referees sometimes make some very dodgy penalty decision that ultimately would cost the team yeah that's exactly what we saw in this instant and again for once an mos team was the benefit of that because we have seen so many times where mos team usually are are the the one one that that unfortunately they are 
are find themselves on the wrong end of a controversial play. Which again, you know, Atlanta, you know, they didn't, re <laughs> they were able to get the penalty, which Barco was able to put away. Oh, that penalty was actually almost saved by Morea, but Barco was able to just put enough pace to get past Morela and give Elena a one nothing lead. But obviously, Alajolense was not happy because they feel like they just got robbed in this. So they basically respond by started to press for the equalizer. And then, and then in the 58th minute, Rios Nova was able to deny Roman. And he actually didn't do a good job to pair this one one away and actually allow a juicy rebound to one of the Alajolense attacker, which this won't. Well, this player was Cabero, and while Cabero was trying to do the follow-up, uh, Rios Novo did do a good job on his second attempt to kind of, kind of cover that. But he did pay the price for trying to, to do so as Cabero actually kind of spiked, hit, him a, a little, little bit there, and 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 you know, you know that definitely looked like like was kind of a painful, full moment there. But you know when when you look at maybe that a couple of times. I think that was also kind of a, a, an incident where Rios Nova was also try, trying to waste some time. And therefore, this is another reason why this game kind of went full concave. Because you also have some, some really theatrical and time-wasting kind of moment that happened in this one. Now, in the 66th minute, Joseph Martinez was finally summoned in this game. And, you know, I understand that, that Atlanta fans would love to see Joseph Martinez to play play in this game but in a game where it's one nothing in favor of Atlanta and they're down to 10 men and they're clearly holding this holding on for dear life and trying to preserve this one nothing thing lead this was a really strange substitution for for Gabriel Heinz to to bring on jo Joseph Martinez and the only thing I can think that that is the reason why Hansi decided to bring him on is maybe get get him some game time and also maybe he can score the second goal to kind of relieve a little bit of, of the pressure of Atlanta poten potentially not able to get the win in this game but still I, I would f think that at that moment Hansen should have maybe bring bring in a de defender to really kind of solidify fight this Atlanta defense defense and trying to hold on for the last 20 minutes because again Alahanse they continue to push for the equalizer and at time they were just throwing the kitchen sink at at Atlanta uh Rios Novo then had to make another another big save this time de denying Martinez and that's Adrian Martinez for Alahanse before Venegas had a chance to score for a 20 yard free kick but unfortunately he hits it wide in the 83rd minute before Rios Novo would make another big big save this time robbing Cap and the the on on the follow up and originally he kind of bob bobbled uh the original you no know, save that he made against one of the Alejandro Halunze attacker and you know if there's one thing that I will say Real Novo didn't do a good job in this game game is that he he of course well I I think I said this before but he didn't do a good job in in terms of trying to trying to to parry that one away and not allow a juicy rebound to one of the Alejandro Halunze attacker. And, and, you know, in this instance, that, of course, is exactly the case. But it seems like every time when he, he basically allowed a juicy rebound to one of the Alajalense attacker, they weren't able to take advantage of it. Or, in this case, he was able to make up for it and make a big save. But, in the end, Atlanta was able to survive in this game by winning one nothing against Alajalense and also snapping of, I think, a 26-game unbeaten streak, as I mentioned here on the broadcast, that Alajalense had a 26-game unbeaten streak coming into this one and Atlanta in the end was able to snap them albeit in a very controversial way uh but shots in this game 17 shots compared to eight that Atlanta has seven shots on goal compared to four that Atlanta has seven shots off target compared to four that Atlanta has three shots that was blocked compared to none that Atlanta has and possession wise uh it was relatively even although you know it was mostly because Atlanta had a lot of possession in the first half and then in the second half since Alahunze was pushing for that equalizer uh, they had all the the possession, and in the end, basically that would mean that that things was eventually going to even now, and it showed it on the possession too. And yeah, you know, overall this was a gutsy performance by Atlanta United, and there's no doubt that I I think when I look at how Atlanta play in the first half, especially on their defensive front, I would have not guessed it that in the second half they they, they would able both to sur survive. By and getting a one no nothing win, but it seemed like maybe that red card kind of helped their defense to be a little bit more more straightened up after 
in the first half, their defense was really playing with fire. And that when they, of course, went down to 10 men, they started to be a little bit compacted. And we did see last season, as bad as Atlanta is, when they are a team that have decided to go very compacted in their defense, they're one of the best teams in, in terms of doing, doing so and not allowing goals. And we saw it again here where they do a good job in terms of going into their compacted shape and not allowing, all of, say, a lot of space or any opportunity opportunity to potentially get the equalizer even though when they're pushing for it so but yeah there you have it that is pretty much it, it for the review of both of these games let me know in the comments below what do you think of both of these games remember tomorrow we got another their game involving being an mos team in the CONCACAF champions league and that of course is the philadelphia union who's making their debut in ccl uh, against saprisa and then on on Thursday, we have Columbus making their return to CCL in over a decade against Estelle. And I, of course, will be doing those review after the game is over. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash the subscribe button. And yeah, I, of course, will see you guys next time.